It's an honor to have Evan Abramson, Abramson with us tonight. Evan is a landscape designer and regional planner dedicated to rebuilding biologically diverse ecosystems. As founder and principal of the company Landscape Interactions, he works closely with project partners from nonprofit, private, and public sectors on efforts ranging from regional corridors to site-specific designs. In 2020, Landscape Interactions was responsible for designing over 100 acres of habitat installed in the Northeast, specifically targeting at-risk bee and butterfly species. Evan holds a Master's of Science in Ecological Design from the Conway School of Landscape Design, Certificates in Permaculture Design and Biodynamic Gardening, and is the author of the Lincoln and Great Barrington Pollinator Action Plans. And in his spare time, we're very grateful that Evan also serves on the steering committee for the Massachusetts Pollinator Network. Evan, thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Um, I'm gonna be talking about um, the work we do um, on landscape design and planning on a regional scale and how we uh, try to create biodiverse landscapes by focusing on the needs of at-risk pollinator species and the native plant communities that have uh, co-evolved with them. So the subject of tonight's talk is designing biodiversity in the age of the Anthropocene. Now, as some of you probably know, um, the web of life on earth is becoming smaller and smaller and it's directly a result of human activity. Our impact on the earth is now so profound that there's a new geological epoch that's been declared, which is called the age of the Anthropocene. And it's defined by many of the um, trends that we've all witnessed in our lifetimes, carbon emissions rising, sea level rising, and the global mass extinction of species, as well as the transformation of land across the planet based on human development and large scale agriculture. And currently, as many as 30 to 50% of all species on the planet are heading toward extinction in the next 20 or 30 years. So what do our leaders say about this? Well, according to Greta, um, all we hear is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, carbon emissions are on track to rise 16% by 2030 rather than fall by half, which was what was originally agreed to in the Paris Accord to keep uh, global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And research which has recently been published shows that children born today will experience many times more extreme heat waves as well as other climate disasters such as flooding and extreme rainfall over their lifetimes and their grandparents even if we fulfill our current emissions pledges. What this really in entails is a total collapse of nature. There's 1 million species on the planet which are threatened with extinction globally, including more than half of the native bee species in North America. Insects are essential for all ecosystems and they could vanish within a century at the current rate of decline. Habitat loss, again, is the most pressing problem as well as new classes of insecticides, especially neonicotinoids. And to quote one scientist, we are sleepwalking towards the edge of a cliff. There's also a crisis uh, on the bird uh, scale or on the trophic level of birds. North America has lost 3 billion birds since 1970, which is over one in four birds in the past 50 years. Again, habitat loss is the most, most direct cause. So you can see the impacts across ecosystems, starting from the insect scale and now moving up to the avian scale. Grasslands hold 20% of global carbon stocks, as well as a third of the world's land-based carbon. And Midwestern glass, grasslands in the United States specifically are a very important um, region for many imperiled plant, insect, and bird species. Right now, US agriculture is over 10% of our country's total emissions. And a 2019 study found that tillage, specifically for the expansion of cropland, put as much carbon into the air in the United States as 31 million cars. A 2018 study found that 
conserving grasslands in the US could prevent almost three times as much carbon emission as conserving forests. And surprisingly, half of all temperate grasslands worldwide have been lost, rather uh, compared to only 20% of grasslands in the Amazon. So we've lost more of the grasslands in places like Europe and the United States. Grasslands are also a very reliable carbon sink. And according to a study from the University of California, Davis, they found that grasslands and ragelands are more resilient carbon sinks than forests in a 21st century scenario in California. Because unlike forests, grasslands sequester most of their carbon underground, whereas forests store it mostly in the woody biomass and leaves, which are above ground. So when wildfires cause trees to go up in flames, the carbon is released into the atmosphere, whereas when fire burns grasslands, which I'll talk about a little bit later on tonight, the carbon is actually still fixed underground and it stays in roots and soil, making them more adaptive to a wildfire climate change scenario. This is a diagram of the root systems of various meadow or prairie plants. And right here on the left, you can see it's Kentucky bluegrass. It's got a root depth of about, let's say two inches. And that's pretty typical of most lawn grasses and golf course grasses and sod forming grasses that we have you know, in pretty much anywhere. Here, uh, this is heath aster, which is one of our native asters. And you can see its root depth is between eight and nine feet. And right here is switchgrass, another native grass, as well as a host plant. Um, and that has a root depth of nearly 12 feet. And over here is little blue stem, which got, also has a pretty deep root depth between six and seven feet. So you can see here really the true difference that I'm trying to point out is between native and non-native plants as far as carbon sequestration potential and uh, soil health. But there is somewhat of a myth regarding uh, root depth. Um, while grasses do have very deep roots, as you can see in this diagram as well, they tend to draw water from just the top 30 inches of the soil, which is called the grass zone. Um, um, I'm sorry, they tend to draw water from um, probably a little bit less than 30 inches, whereas forbs, which are flowers, tend to draw water from within the top 30 inches, so a little bit lower. Where um, comparatively shrubs, um, mainly get water uh, be below 18 inches and can draw water from as far down as eight to 10 feet or beyond. And so um, the value of this is really seeing that having a diverse grouping of plants uh, in a landscape, not only does it benefit pollinators who need to collect pollen, have nectar and nesting sites throughout the season, but it also benefits uh, soil health, carbon sequestration, uh, nutrient movement in soil from lower depths to higher depths and water, um, water uh, holding potential of soil. So um, the objective here um, in this is tonight's talk is really to talk about how to design nature or how to design biodiversity in this age of the Anthropocene. And I firmly believe that farms, conservation lands, suburban landscapes, urban landscapes and rural communities are really our greatest opportunities for not only expanding biodiversity regionally, but also having uh, more resilience to climate change. Because essentially what happens at the pollination scale has uh, effects all the way up the food chain to the largest predators in humans, as you can see from this diagram. You know, what bees, butterflies, moths, and other insects uh, pollinate um, produces seeds and fruit which then feeds primary consumers such as birds and herbivores like deer, which then in turn feed secondary consumers and all the way up to tertiary consumers or predators. And um, the most important attribute for any natural system really is ecological resilience, particularly because of the climate change scenario that we're facing. So you wanna have a landscape that has a wide range of species so that if um, an extreme event occurs such as a flood, um, drought, wildfire, wildfire, pests, invasives, invasive species, invasive worms, that there's going to be other plants there in the ecosystem, in the landscape that can survive and bounce back.
And a lot of that will also have to do with the genetic diversity of the plant communities there. So why are pollinators so important? Um, they're obviously primarily insects in the Northeast that fertilize plants producing seeds and fruit, and they assist over 80% of the world's flowering plants. Bees alone pollinate nearly half of the food crops grown in Massachusetts, as well as one third of the food grown in the United States. So they're really vital to uh, creating habitats and ecosystems. And some plants uh, rely upon particular uh, genus or families or even species of pollinators to assure, ensure their pollination. And it's um, considered that in the Northeast, approximately 15% of native bees are pollen specialists at the family or genus level. So what are the needs of a bee when we're thinking about them and we're trying to create a landscape to support them since they're so important? Um, there's approximately 4,000 native bee species in the US and nearly 400 or over 400 live in the Northeast. They do the vast majority of pollination. In a global study looking at 40 different food crops across the entire globe, wild pollinators were twice as effective as honeybees in producing seeds and fruit. Yet they only range on average between 200 and 1800 feet from their nest as far as needed bees. So you really have to have a lot of connectivity in the landscape. You can't rely upon things that are too far away because they simply won't go there. 70% of bees are ground nesting. Most live alone. They don't have colonies like honeybees do. And other examples of their habitat include bare exposed ground and well-draining soil, um, soft twigs that they can burrow in, um, dead limbs or trees, and abandoned rodent burrows. This diagram is looking at a few properties from one of our projects um, and the distance between these different sites where habitat for pollinators was being installed and the average flight distance of various native bee species. You can see here that bumblebees clearly go the furthest um, compared to a sweat bee, for example, which ranges very close to its nest. So the more uh, connected areas you can have in a given town or neighborhood or city or region, the more of a chance you're gonna have at actually creating what people refer to as a pollinator corridor. If things are spread too far apart, you're really not gonna be able to um, carry species from one place to the next. Other significant pollinators besides bees, you know, we all know the ruby-throated hummingbird. It's not at risk, but it's a great uh, pollinator, um, pretty productive. The Aphrodite fritillary is an example of an at-risk butterfly in Massachusetts, as well as other uh, Northeast states. Um, the monarch butterfly is um, globally in decline, but relatively stable in Massachusetts. And uh, the Diane skipper is another example of a um, threatened butterfly species, which inhabits very particular type of habitat, sedge wetland, wetlands and marshes and swamps. So depending upon the landscape, what type of uh, soils or existing um, plant communities are there, you might wanna target different pollinator species for that site. If it's a very dry site, for example, it really wouldn't make sense to plant uh, host plants for a Dion skipper because they only inhabit wetlands. And you can say the same thing for um, pollinators such as um, Aphrodite fritillary, you know, you want to uh, understand where their range is, where they go in the state or in the region. If your project site is not anywhere near where they've ever been found, they may not be uh, a suitable target for your restoration strategy. Um, we all know about uh, honeybee colony collapse disorder. Um, you can see here between 1980 and 2005, we lost half our honeybee colonies in the United States mostly due again to habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change. Yet in the last 15 or 16 years, uh, honeybee colonies have actually been going back up and even stabilizing to pre-2000 uh, levels. And that has a lot to do with uh, support from the government through the USDA and other programs. Yet wild bees are down 23%. And this is based on just a uh, five-year study that was done about uh, four years ago. So you can see here, uh, the areas that are yellow have the lowest wild bee diversity. And it's really no coincidence that, that these areas also have the highest use of neonicotinoid pesticides, as you can see from this diagram. Um, Imida clobrid was uh, the first 
commercial neonicotinoid. And um, it's widely used. It's also used for flea and tech prevention for pests. And this diagram is basically a twin mirror image of areas with the lowest uh, wild bee diversity. So pesticides have a huge role, as does habitat loss, because also the areas in the darkest color red are the areas that are largely the most developed in our country. Urban areas on the coast, large farming regions. So honeybees and native bees, what's the difference? Why should we care? Well, this is just a small list of peer reviewed journals looking at the subject and essentially uh, honeybees outcompete native bees for pollen ne and nectar. And if you have one hive, it's gonna collect enough pollen in three months to uh, effectively support 100,000 uh, wild bees. So honeybee hives should not be put on conservation properties. They should not be in natural environments. They should be restricted to areas that are already converted away from native plant communities because honeybees are not native. So they can pollinate pretty much any flower. They're best suited to be on farms and perhaps in highly developed urban and suburban areas because they essentially cause the decline of local pollinators, including bumblebees, hoverflies, March flies, and solitary bees. Conserving honeybees does not help wildlife. If you wanna help wildlife, support native bees. It's really like if you wanna support birds, don't raise chickens. It just is not gonna really help. Chickens essentially will not outcompete wild birds, but they're also not gonna help them if you raise them. So what is pollinator friendly and what is it, what, what, how is this word or this term used and what are we trying to do um, with pollinator habitat restoration? Well, unfortunately, most efforts to restore pollinator habitat have focused on increasing just a handful of species that tend to be common and abundant. As I mentioned, there's a very specialized relationship between many pollinators and plants. And that's shown in the fact that there's about 300,000 unique species of flowering plants on the globe and about 200,000 unique species of animal pollinators. That is a two to three ratio at the species scale of individual insects and animals that pollinate and individual plant species that are pollinated by them. So not every bee needs the same thing. Not every pollinator is gonna be assisted by planting just about anything. You really have to understand what their particular floral and nesting needs are. Seeing lots of bees does not mean that your, that your landscape is actually pollinator friendly. You might just be supporting the same species that are already um, doing really well and not in decline. Um, this video here is of Bumbus vagans, which is one of the at-risk bumblebee species in the Northeast, pollinating a bottle gentian. And uh, this essentially illustrates a specialist relationship um, in the sense that only bumblebees are large enough to force their way into the flower and only long-tongued bumblebees would have the ability to actually reach the nectar reward in this flower, thereby ensuring its pollination. So there's only about four or perhaps five bumblebee species that can pollinate this flower and about two or three of them are in decline. So you can imagine what could happen in the next short while if we don't turn things around. And that is essentially the difference between diversity and abundance. Um, so as I mentioned in Massachusetts, we've got about 11 bumblebee species. Currently two of them are extirpated, meaning they're no longer being found in the state. That's Bum Bumbus pensylvanicus and Bumbus affinis. And um, we're expecting uh, two more species to be gone within the next decade, unless things drastically change. Um, having lots of bees on a property is not always a good thing. It could all be Bumbus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee. As you can see here, historical levels, Bumbus impatiens in low elevation areas of the state, here at the bottom, um, they were in lower numbers than they are right now. And in higher elevation areas, they were barely even here um, prior to uh, 1990 or 2000. Now in the high elevation areas of the state where I live in Western Mass, Bumbus impatiens is um, the most prevalent bumblebee species. And it's largely uh, the only species in many sites. 
and Mass Wildlife, our state uh, agency lists five more bees, as well as 44 butterflies and moths as species of greatest conservation need. So we've really got to help them. Diversity in a landscape is resilience. Animal and plant species diversity means ecological resiliency. And this is what we need because our climate is changing and we don't know what's gonna happen or how long it will last. We need to think about a diverse combination of plant and animal species on the landscape, not just one thing. And that's why monoculture sites such as farms don't work. And that's why pollinator plantings that keep using the same common 30 species like purple coneflower, which isn't even native to Massachusetts, they don't work. They're not resilient, they're not diverse, and they don't support pollinators. We're also facing native plant community loss. At present, 22% of the native plants, uh, native plant species and groups in New England are either globally, regionally, or locally imperiled or extirpated. Um, in a study that was done in Concord, Massachusetts, um, observations conducted by Henry David Thoreau and others between the mid to late 1800s and the early 1900s were compared to uh, floral observations conducted between 2003 and 2009. And they found that 27% of the species that had been recorded in the 19th century were no longer present. And another 36%, which used to be common, were now rare. Many of these rare species exist existed in this case in Concord in only small populations, in some cases, just a couple of plants. And the trend also is affecting pollinators, not just plants. In a 2020 study, researchers at uh, the University of New Hampshire and um, in Canada found that um, habitat loss, primarily from expanding agriculture and development, as well as climate change, was the, was the driver for a 94% loss of plant pollinator networks across northern New England over the past 125 years. And their conclusion from this was that we need to have conservation efforts focused specifically on habitat restoration for declining wild bee and plant species, not common species, not abundant species, and not honeybees. We are running out of time. Small isolated populations of plants or animals are likely to get caught in an extinction vortex of catastrophes, including things like genetic erosion, inbreeding depression, and alley effects. The standard conservation practice, not just for plants, but especially so in the Northeast with regards to plant conservation, is to carefully manage populations that are becoming rare or extirpated and to keep them in isolation in order to preserve genetic distinctiveness. This is what people refer to when they talk about these local ecotype plants, that this type of goldenrod, which is only found, let's say in this place, um, is not like other goldenrods in the state or in the region. Therefore, we shouldn't mix them. We shouldn't allow them to hybridize. However, here is just a small list of peer-reviewed journals that have looked at this subject extensively. And the consensus is that we must restore gene flow into these small isolated populations in order to alleviate genetic load and decrease the risk of extinction. Plant translocations allow the restoration of genetic diversity. And current concerns about outbreeding depression, which is what people talk about all the time when they say that we shouldn't introduce plants from a different area or a different ecoregion to um, mix or cross pollinate or inbreed with uh, rare plant species. These concerns in, in, in populations which are recently fragmented are almost certainly excessive. And that's according to several studies, not just one, and when they say recently fragmented populations, they mean in the last 500 years. Now, we all know that most, if not all of these extirpated plant communities were not fragmented 500 years ago. They were quite stable. It's really, as Rosemary uh, said to me yesterday, letting the perfect get in the way of the good. You know, we can't do things perfectly. We're running out of time. Climate change is happening now and plant and pollinator extinction is happening now. 
A seed transfer zone is a concept which has been promoted by the US Forest, Forest Service and other agencies. Uh, and it's understood as an area within which plant materials can be transferred with little risk of being poorly adapted to their new location. And that's really what this map is. This map is a color coordinated, color differentiated map of the different seed transfer zones in the continental United States according to the US Forest Service and many other agencies. Now, you can see here, this uh, second circle is um, around the driftless area, which is a border area between Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. Why did I pick this area? It's because it has the same seed transfer zone as a large part of New England and the Northeast United States, including New York State. It also happens to be the location of Prairie Moon Nursery, Prairie Nursery, and many other nurseries, which are the few, if only, um, suppliers, commercial suppliers of a wide range of native plant seeds. So you can see here Prairie Moon. They're in this region right here of uh, Minnesota, right on the border with uh, Wisconsin. This is Ernst Seeds. They're in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania near Lake Erie. Wild Seed Project, another great local uh, seed source, although they don't really sell commercially. They're in Portland, Oregon. Key, New Hampshire, one of our project sites. Another one of our project sites in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and Leiden, Massachusetts, another one of our project sites. These are all places where I have either currently been in the process of sourcing seeds for ecological restoration for pollinators, or I did so uh, last year. And these are all nurseries that I've either communicated with regarding ordering seeds or I've purchased seeds from. Now you can see here Prairie Moon, they're in um, this region, which is defined as five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, two to three centimeters precipitation. I believe that is the average or it might be the average uh, lowest, but regardless, that's the classification of the area. Now look here, Key, New Hampshire, exact same area, five to, degree, five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, two to three centimeters precipitation. Earned seeds, 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, two to three centimeters precipitation. Lincoln, Massachusetts, same thing, 15 to 20 Fahrenheit, two to three centimeters. Wild Seed Project, 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, less than two degrees, I mean, less than two centimeters precipitation. And Leiden Mass, five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, less than two centimeters. I am showing this because there does not exist a commercial purveyor of native seeds that has the same seed transfer zone as this site where I happen to live. The closest would probably be Prairie Moon or Wild Seed Project. Now, here is the, north, the eastern seaboard availability of species in seeds and plants and of ecotype, local ecotype seeds and plants. Red means poor availability, blue means decent to good. And this is in a study that was published uh, last October. There are no local ecotype seeds available. Very, very few areas have them. And if they do, it's in a very low species diversity. You're not gonna get 50, 100 different species to choose from. And if you do, it's mostly grasses and sedges. My point is just because you're getting seeds or plants from a place in the upper Midwest doesn't mean that it's not genetically appropriate or regionally appropriate for a restoration project in the Northeast. In fact, it could be more similar than a Northeast nursery such as Ernst in the case of Leiden and Keene. So who's in charge here? Local ecotype native seed and plant stock is difficult to obtain, especially in high numbers, like if you're seeding by the acre or by the dozens of acres. You're not allowed to use rare plants if they're from out of state on most ecological restoration projects, which are regulated by state agencies, such as the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program of Mass Wildlife or the UMass Amherst uh, Pollinator Friendly Certification Program for solar projects. 
You also can't collect rare plant seeds locally without a permit. And the permits are difficult to obtain. You have to go through mass wildlife again. At-risk pollinators like rare plants, as we saw in the diagram, looking at the 94% plant pollinator network loss in New England over the past 125 years. The reason why these pollinators are in decline is the same reason why these plants are in decline in most cases. Do pollinators care where their seeds come from or will they pollinate those plants and be able to reproduce as a result of that? Well, bees like Bumbus vegans and the rusty patch bumblebee and the Aphrodite fritillary are found in the upper Midwest. So you would, you would think that they would be able to pollinate and visit and successfully help reproduce a seed of one of the plants that they prefer from those regions. And what are the consequences of current restoration strategies? If we keep babysitting these isolated populations of rare plants, what's gonna happen? They're going to get inbreeding depression and they're going to go extinct. This is what matters. Don't plant pollinator habitat near pesticides, plant native plants, cultivars, hybrids, and non-native plants do not support the pollen and nectar preferences of threatened pollinators and they tend to favor common pollinator species. Ensure your plants come from a clean pesticide free source, whether it's a nursery or seed supplier. If you're planting milkweeds, don't use tropical varieties. And if you're providing bee housing, check it and clean it every year. Here's a few case studies from some of our project sites where we've tried to embody the, um, the points that I've made in this uh, introduction. Um, this is a project we did in Ridgefield, Connecticut. It was at a farm site called McKean Farm. And uh, we created essentially a toolkit using this landscape as an example for other sites in the region. Uh, this is an overview of the site. Um, it was um, once a fully productive farm. Now it's only partially uh, productive, mostly for grazing, which are the areas here that are green. And our restoration areas were outside of the grazing areas. We uh, restored an old hedgerow. We created a larger expanded meadow and a lower meadow area here, which was really taken over by invasives and shrubs, as well as a wet meadow restoration site. Uh, these are the at-risk pollinators that were supported by the uh, plants and the management guidelines for this particular design in Ridgefield. So you can see we targeted uh, the rusty patch bumblebee, Bombus fervidus, the golden northern bumblebee, Bombus, Bombus pensylvanicus, Bombus vagans, as well as over 20 uh, butterfly species. And here's the uh, final design for the site. Uh, the idea with this is that anyone who lives near this site or in a similar landscape could um, download this toolkit online, look at the plant list, follow the management guidelines, and essentially recreate uh, or restore habitat for these at-risk species. And that's really the approach we take with most of our projects. We use a site-specific example working closely with a project partner, whether it's a land conservation organization, a working farm, a private landowner, a town or city government, a solar company. And we really use the site specific to speak to the larger needs of the region or of the community. This is a, a section of the, uh, the area crossing a mowed path in between the meadow and the hedgerow. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, we provide establishment and maintenance guidelines. So we had site prep guidelines for the different meadow areas. They were prepared a little bit differently between the upper and lower meadow and a mowing schedule to follow. Um, this is another toolkit we did in Southwest Connecticut in a more residential landscape in Westport. And this was done in partnership with the Aspetuck Land Trust. Overview of the site, it was really a large residential property which had uh, turned into a public park. And so we designed six design areas. And uh, design area two was a highly uh, formal garden in a former courtyard. Um, this is uh, the pollinator action plan for the town of Lincoln, which we completed uh, last winter. Uh, it's a regional plan that looks at also site-specific examples in the, in the um, 
in the in the service of replicability and scalability across the town and the region. So science informs the design process, not just in Lincoln, but with all of our projects. Uh, pictured here is doc, Dr. Robert Jagir from UMass Dartmouth. He uh, surveyed uh, three of our sites in Lincoln, as well as in McKean Farm and um, in Westport, um, before any of our plants were determined for the designs. And the purpose of that is to create a baseline. What are the pollinators that are on the site before we make any changes? And our goal with the changes in the landscape is to attract a wider range of species as a result, especially at-risk species. So um, our criteria for measuring the success of the project in Lincoln is native bumblebee and butterfly species diversity sustained over time. So we don't just attract these at-risk species once, but we see them stay on the site year after year. Uh, the plant selection for the site supports species richness across functional traits, trophic levels, and animal groups. And over time, functional diversity is improved. In other words, the diversity of the landscape is improved because more niches in the ecosystem are being filled. And as a result of the Lincoln project, um, plant kits were sold by the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust to people in the community that wanted to have the same plants on their own properties. And during the first year of the project, before we even installed our first case study sites, 98 plant kits were uh, sold and installed to various private landowners across the region, which was essentially uh, 2,000 plants. And here is um, a planting at a local school, which was one of our sites. So um, here on the left is a map of the town of Lincoln. Um, you have here the four toolkit sites, which represent different types of landscapes, different types of habitat conditions, and different types of land use. Each of them um, is going to be replicated across the town in the creation of the corridor. Here in lighter purple are all of the properties where toolkit plants were sold as part of the planting kits. And so you can see even before the first year of the project, before we were even done with the plan and before we had published it, um, all of these properties in Lincoln had plants from our recommended list installed. And this is a, in yellow is a 500 foot buffer around those property edges. It's really a visualization of the average uh, range of a native bee. The idea is with more landscapes, installing these plants in Lincoln and in surrounding communities, more of these areas will become connected and bees and other animals will be able to travel from, from site to site. This is our list of recommended plants for the Lincoln project. We uh, really largely recommend them for the Northeastern part of Massachusetts. And so you can see here, we've got plants like purple giant hyssop, big blue stem, tall white aster, northern bush honeysuckle, Atlantic white cedar, button bush, scrub oak, various native roses, native willows, um, scutellaria, skullcap, many different goldenrods and asters and spireas, zizia, high bush blueberry, low bush blueberry, 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 bee balm, switchgrass, just like a really, really rich selection of plants that essentially provides all of the pollen nest nectar host plant and nesting requirements for all of the target um, pollinator species. Um, our three toolkit sites in Lincoln were um, the People for Pollinator site, which represented a meadow and woodland site, a, a meadow and woodland edge, Chapman pasture, which was an old field site. It was an abandoned sheep pasture, which is pictured here with the rendering of the final design. Um, we had a wet meadow site, upper browning fields, and a garden and lawn site which was really a small school uh, property in the center of town, the Birches School. And so in the plan, each site has an overview, a discussion of the existing conditions of the site. This is people for pollinators. And then we go into the final design, which has its own site specific plant list. And so this plant list is publicly available as part of the Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan. Um, all of our work is publicly available. You can find it on our various uh, partner project sites. We also have some of them on our website, landscapeinteractions.com, under the uh, services page, um, or you can go to the Lincoln Land Trust, um, Land Conservation Trust site and do download the, the toolkit. 
And really, if you just Google the name of any of these toolkits, you'll find them, McKee and Farm Toolkit, um, Green Corridor Toolkit, Med, um, Lincoln Pollinator Action Plan. Um, for our old field toolkit at Chapman Pasture, you can see here, the site was almost entirely non-native grasses for grazing. This picture was taken in 2019. And our final recommendation was to fully seed the entire site with a seed drill, as well as plant groupings of shrubs and trees, flowers and bunching grasses around areas in the site where there were exposed rocks, as well as in this wet swale, which runs through uh, the Eastern part of the site. However, in order to do that, part of the management guidelines called for a prescribed burn of the entire meadow in order to knock back those non-native grasses, which were really persistent. And we assisted the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust in, um, in writing up a burn plan uh, for the site and actually burning the site through a partnership with the US, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program. So here's our list of uh, seed mix species. Uh, we also have the plant list on the previous page. Um, similar plants to what we discussed earlier because I read you the plant list for the Lincoln project as a whole. And here is a picture of uh, Chapman pasture uh, in May of this year after the entire field was burned. So you can see here that the burn was quite effective. It really uh, changed the, the makeup of the site. And I went back to the site um, in July and there were a lot, a lot of flowers blooming there, especially milkweed and St. John's wort, things that were basically dor uh, dormant in the seed bank, just waiting for an opportunity to emerge. Um, and this year in the fall, the land trust is planning on seeding the site with a seed drill as recommended in the plan. So we're really excited about that. Um, our wet meadow uh, toolkit for upper browning fields in Lincoln essentially just called for specific mowing changes to the site in order to promote existing native plant communities, knock back um, undesired invasives such as glossy buckthorn through um, spot burning treatments and pulling and then planting just a few areas of the site very minimally. Um, our toolkit for the school site, the Birches School, um, was a big collaboration with the community. Um, I think over a hundred uh, parents, students and teachers came out for the planting, which uh, hopefully will look like this in a few years. Uh, this is what the site looked like before anything was installed. And here they're starting to install the habitat areas. And this site, uh, what's interesting about it is it's a really small area, less than an acre that was designed. And it really essentially represents a residential landscape in the center of town. So it's quite appealing to a lot of private landowners. And a lot of people have been following this uh, sort of design framework and plant list. Um, these maps, which I'm gonna show you are looking at the opportunities for the replicability of the various toolkit sites in Lincoln. So here in yellow, you have um, the various sites in town which have similar landscapes to either the Burgess School or the People for Pollinators Meadow and Woodland uh, site. These here in the middle in brown are sites that are larger and they have larger areas of open field or open pasture. They would be uh, similar for replicability to Chapman pasture. And lastly, the areas here in green on the right are parcels that have wetlands, open water, priority or estimated habitat for your species, or they're within close proximity to uh, those wet, wetter areas of the site. And those um, are most suitable for the replication of the browning fields, wet meadow toolkit. Um, here, we've selected in um, Lavender, all of the sites within 500 feet of the sites in Lincoln in dark purple, which already have the habitat installed, which I spoke about previously. So you can see here with a 500 foot buffer on those sites representing the average foraging range of a native bee, all the opportunities for connectivity in Lincoln, if only sites that are within 500 feet of a site that already has the habitat installed, also install habitat. And we're really not that far from there. Just in the first year since the plan was published and uh, announced, the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust has done a lot of public outreach and planting. Here on the top left, uh, high school students are installing plants at the People for Pollinator site. On the bottom right, um, another group of students is installing native plants as for one of our design sites. And you have here um, top right and bottom left, two of the sites in town 
where the habitat is already installed and people are putting up the signs as part of the pollinator pathway. Um, Pollinate Northampton was another project we did in collaboration with um, the Massachusetts Pollinator Network and Western Mass Bees. And it was a little bit different from other projects that we've done in that we uh, created landscape designs which were not based on actual sites. They were just based on approximations of the size and the dimensions of common types of landscape typologies that you would find in Northampton and other similar town centers in Western and Central Massachusetts. So you see here, we did a design for a sidewalk strip, a common landscape feature in town centers. Uh, we also did a, a design for a lawn conversion to support uh, bees and butterflies through flowering plants and host plants, which are somewhat tolerant of mowing. And this toolkit is available online. If you Google Pollinate Northampton Toolkit, or you can go to uh, landscapeinteractions.com forward slash services and download it there. It's got guidelines and instructions. Um, the last project I'm gonna talk about tonight is grazing for biodiversity. Um, it's a project I've been working on for the past two growing seasons, looking at the impact of rotational grazing of livestock, sheep and a llama on native plant communities and native pollinators. So all of these pictures are from the first year where we really just, um, we didn't gather any data. We just um, moved the animals across a nine acre meadow, which is um, right outside my house in Leiden, Massachusetts. It's a conservation restriction that I uh, abut and own. And um, after this first year, um, we, I worked with um, a friend and collaborator of mine, Tim Tenson, um, from Terragenesis, as well as Adam Cole, field botanist at Landscape Interactions, to uh, come up with a study design that would um, survey the impacts of this rotational grazing on native plant communities. And so uh, we started off this growing season by burning the entire field with US Fish and Wildlife Service. This happened the same week as the burn of Chapman Pasture in Lincoln. It was through the partners program that we received a grant for. And um, the burn was uh, highly successful. It really resulted in a lot of uh, native plant community um, growth and diversity on the site. Here you can see the animals uh, just last month. Uh, little blue stem came in really strongly following the burn and the animals simply grazed around it. They ate things that were growing next to it. And in the case of the little blue stem, they might've nibbled it the first couple of weeks after the burn. And they, then they left it alone. Um, here you can see various species of late season flowers, golden rods and asters, as well as Indian grass and little blue stem, which really benefited from the grazing in that the animals uh, largely avoided them and grazed around them and did not graze them once they had gone to flower or seed. Um, so this was the survey area that we looked at. Um, it's a 69 acre property on the Green River in Leiden. Um, these are our four habitat areas representing the different types of ecological communities on the site. So you have an area here at the top of the field closer to the house and the barn, which is really a transition area between non-native lawn grasses and sod forming grasses and agricultural grasses into what is essentially um, a native grassland community dominated by little blue stem and Indian grass, um, which is here in yellow. Here in pink are areas that were under partial shade from canopy tree species, but they were still subject to grazing. And here in blue are areas that were wetter portions of the site. So the uh, areas here in um, green, pink, orange, yellow, red, and blue are the different grazing rotations. Each of them is a 0.75 acre parcel, which the animals move through over the course of a week. They would start at the top, they would have a break line set up and every two or three days, the break line would be extended so that they essentially move through the entire parcel in seven days. Now here are all our samplings over the 2021 growing season for native plant species. So you can see here, we sampled both from inside the grazing areas and from outside the grazing areas across all of the different ecological types of the site. That is so we have a control and we can show the differences. And I haven't fully um, analyzed and gathered all the data. The survey just end the, ended the other week, but um, our baseline results are basically the following. Uh, with the right timing and intensity, 
rotational grazing and native floral diversity is possible in the same field. You can feed livestock and pollinators simultaneously, at the same time building soil carbon, improving nutrient flow and water retention, as we saw from all the different root depths of native species which grow in fields, uh, including some of the shrubs that we have here in Leiden. Um, our plan for this fall and going into the winter is to direct seed over 60 species of native plants because we really still don't have a really high range of diversity. We we're getting there, we're doing better, but we could do more. And this here is a list of native species that um, were found in the site that were in the grazing area as well as the ungrazed area and were able to flower and set seed within both areas. So you have plants like common yarrow, common milkweed, Pennsylvania sedge, um, um, broad leaved, a big leaved aster, um, wild strawberry, St. John's wort, common self heel, various species of native raspberry, even native willow, little blue stem, Indian grass, and many species of goldenrod and aster, as well as meadow sweet and steeple bush, um, and even low bush blueberry. All of these species can coexist with grazing animals such as sheep and llama in the same field, be grazed either lightly or grazed around. And if the animals are moved every week, they'll go to flower and they'll set seed and they'll support pollinators. So um, essentially throughout our project sites at Landscape Interactions, we try to measure the success of the landscape design or of the plan based on improving functional diversity over time. We use native bumblebee species largely as a, as a metric or a measurement of success or failure. If we have a wider range of species after the plants and management guidelines have been implemented than before the project began, especially at-risk species, then we've done good. We've done our role. We've created a more biodiverse site. And we usually study our sites over a three-year period. So um, this is um, my website, landscapeinteractions.com. You can read more about our work here. And um, I look forward to taking questions from the group. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. That was wonderful. And thank you everyone for contributing information um, during the talk as well. There's a lot of really good stuff in the chat. Um, and I just wanna remind folks that you can actually save the chat. So there are three little dots um, uh, at the bottom of the chat window, right above where you would type your message and you can save the chat by clicking on that. Okay, we have some questions already in the chat um, that came in during the talk. So I'm gonna ask some of those, but uh, folks feel free to put in a, you know, some more questions into the chat now. Uh, one question that came in uh, that I thought was really important is about uh, pesticides. So, the person who wrote the question said that their neighbor is treating their lawn, even though that they don't. And they're wondering if it's um, okay to still collect seeds from their own property to distribute. Um, I think it really depends on what the pesticides are. And uh, until you, you know, talk to your neighbor and find out or try to, you know, talk to the landscaping crews that are working on their site, it's really hard to say, but, um, you know, Arguably, it's really not necessary to treat lawns with any chemicals. And um, I think that if the treatments are for the purpose of killing insects, there is a high likelihood that those uh, types of chemicals would be harmful to plants that are producing seed on an adjacent site, unless there's an adequate forested buffer. For example, if your site had a 50 or 100 foot wide strip of trees and shrubs in between it and your neighbor's site, or if it was not downslope, then that might be an, an adequate enough buffer to collect those seeds. But I would say um, maybe not until you find out more. Great. Um, and someone also asked, how many years does it take for a project to look like um, the ones that you have on the slides? I'm not sure which one they were referencing at the time, but they're basically wondering how long it takes for a site to sort of mature. You know, it depends on the, um, a lot depends on, you know, who is, who is the landowner or who is the project partner. 
you know, when we work with some groups, um, they have a very limited budget, but they might have a lot of volunteer support or staff and they're able to get things going. They implement things right away and things take off within the first growing season. After planting, we are seeing a change in pollinator species. We're seeing flowers on the site and things are starting to fill in. Other projects, you know, sometimes people don't implement them for years or even ever. And it really is the, the responsibility of the, um, of the landowner or the land uh, manager. Um, I can say that we've had a lot of success in the past year with most of our sites where most of them have been fully installed within the first growing season, not all of them. Um, and with solar companies who, with whom we work a lot um, on pollinator friendly solar sites, everything's implemented immediately because they're, uh, they're doing this, they've got a budget, it's a corporation and they wanna see this work, either they're getting a credit for it or they uh, are doing it for you know, other uh, reasons. And you know, those are the kinds of projects where you know, honestly, it's quite exciting because you're putting in like something like 20 or 30 acres of seeds all at once. And you're just seeing things take off. Um, meadow establishment from seed generally takes two full growing seasons. The first growing season, uh, seedlings just start to emerge. That's why the mowing plan is so important because you're really trying to knock back those uh, non-native plants, especially grasses from swallowing out the new seedlings. By the second growing season, you're gonna to start to see flowers emerge. And by the third, it's relatively filled in. If you establish a meadow or a site from plug or from you know, pots, um, you're gonna see the results in a much faster turnaround time within less than a year in some cases. Thank you. Um, there was also a question about deer management. I think in particular uh, where you did the, the, farm, the farmland restoration and how you, how you manage deer. Um, you know, I, I, um, allow, um, you know, people, the people that are at the site that are stewarding the site to really make the final call. I'm available for questions. We discuss things, but like, I don't really have like a go-to for deer, um, because each site is totally different. So a lot of our sites in Connecticut, high deer pressure, some, some towns like Westport, they don't even allow hunting. So the deer are just you know, out of control, taking over everything. And they'll even browse native plants that are listed, you know, vetted as you know, deer, deer resistant. Um, the strategy there has been to spray the plants with a deer, um, a deer uh, spray. Those sprays are sometimes made of urine, coyote urine, sometimes they're made of, um, natural essential oils. Some of them are made from blood from um, livestock. And um, I know that our partners in Westport and in Ridgefield, Connecticut have been spraying a lot for deer um, almost every week during the growing season. We have yet to see how it will affect pollinators. It will be interesting, um, especially next growing season when the flowers are really starting to emerge on those sites. Um, other sites, the deer pressure is not as intense. And we might just uh, net net or cage the plants for the winter, especially the shrubs, which which you know don't completely die back in the winter and are subject to browse. Great. Um, we also have a question about uh, budgeting, and so uh, Anita is asking if you could provide a budget estimate for the design and applications for the town of Lincoln. Um, I, um, I don't have that right now. Um, and I don't want to say the wrong thing, but, um, I can, I can, I can tell you that I can give you a few numbers regarding some things like, for example, seeds, seeds and the types of mixes that we're creating for the sites in Lincoln are about $1,500 an acre. Um, they need to be installed in most cases with some sort of site preparation beforehand, either tarping, sod cutting, burning, uh, seed drilling. Seed drilling is the most expensive. Um, you have to uh, rent or find someone that owns a seed drill that has different boxes for different size seeds because native plants have seeds at various sizes and are planted at various depths in the soil. And getting a seed drill probably costs a couple thousand dollars a day. Um, burning, 
is very expensive. It cost about $25,000 to burn Chapman pasture that was fully funded by US Fish and Wildlife Service. And the reason why it was so expensive is there is not currently a burn team with the right uh, certification to do prescribed fire um, anywhere in the North, in anywhere in New England. They had to come from Southern New Jersey in the Pine Barrens. And so they had a very high fee regarding, um, you know, getting on site and unloading their equipment. Um, tarping might be the least expensive uh, next to sod cutting. Sod cutting is very cheap. You can rent a sod cutter for about $150 per day. You put a tank of gas in it and you push it. You roll up the grass and you have a relatively clean um, area to plant in, although the grasses do tend to come back. So you have to stay on top of weeding the first two years. Um, tarping is something that I really encourage people to look at. You can go to johnnysseeds.com and get a silage tarp, which is six millimeter plastic, black on one side, white on the other. It's about uh, $200 for a silage tarp, which is 2,400 square feet. So you could tarp um, a quarter of an acre for, um, what is that? Um, 10, you know, maybe two or $3,000. And then you can reuse them again and again. Um, you can reuse them all over your property. You just do the tarping. You wanna leave it down for essentially the entire growing season. You wanna weigh it down on all sides with rocks or bricks, cinder blocks or sandbags. And when you remove it, you have what's known as a stale seed bed. You've got nothing growing and it's ready to uh, seed or plant directly into. Um, as far as plants, um, if you're using small plugs, those tend to be approximately one plug per square foot. If it's a larger plant, they might be one plug every three square feet, every five square feet. If it's a shrub, you might be looking at one plug every 10 or 20 square feet and even more. And the price is uh, commensurate with the plant size. So you can get small plugs if you buy them wholesale for a dollar a plug up to maybe $3 a plug. Whereas if you're buying a one or five gallon shrub or one or five gallon plug, you're gonna be paying 20, 30, $40 per plant. Excellent. Uh, we also have a question about managing Asian jumping worms. It's a bit big. I don't know big... about it. <laughs> That's I, I mean, I know, I know it exists and I was at a site recently that had it. Um, and I know two nurseries that have tragically gotten it infested with it. And I don't know of any known cure or way to deal with it other than if it's a nursery, extensively cleaning the roots and the, getting rid of all the contaminated soil. And if it's a site, I think they might be experimenting with some sort of biological control, but I'm not really privy to the, to the up-to-date info. I think UMass Amherst and other agricultural extensions are working on that right now. Yeah, that's unfortunately been a, uh, seems to be a growing problem or folks are discovering it more and more within the state, unfortunately. Um, we also have a question about whether you've been involved with the Kestrel Land Trust Pollinator Garden. I have not. Um, I don't know anything about it. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably in, Amherst or Northampton or Hadley. Um, I'd be happy to um, help out if some if they need my help. Um, although I'm pretty busy right now, so I'm trying to be somewhat selective with what I do. Um, but you know, they could look at the Pollinate Northampton toolkit and um, follow those management guidelines and those plant lists because it's largely the same exact uh, situation over there. Excellent. Um, we have time for maybe a few more questions, um, and then you know, I want to respect everyone's time, um, uh, and we're you know we're going a little bit past eight o'clock. So um, conveniently, my uh, my Zoom chat just froze. So if anyone has a question, I encourage you to unmute yourself and and please ask. Hi, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, it's Maria Bartlett. My question was, I have a one and a half acre, uh, you know, yard, and I'm trying to convert it uh, 
you know, it's all organic, but I'm trying to plant more native plants. Um, what is my likelihood of success if I am surrounded by homeowners who uh, pay for Mosquito Joe services to come in and spray their yards um, or other properties that use pesticides and herbicides and spray, you know, for anything that walks. So am I doomed if I'm surrounded by, you know, yards like that? It, it, uh, you know, what, it, what, it, what should I do? Um, I think that you're looking at uh, essentially creating an, an ecological trap on your site which is when um, plants that attract pollinators or other wildlife species are installed and the species are attracted to those plants and habitat features, and then they're drawn to the site and then they uh, are harmed as a result. In this case, the harm would come from your neighboring, um, the, the patterns on your neighbor's properties with pesticide applications. I'm particularly concerned about, you know, spraying, aerial spraying, such as for mosquitoes, because that really does tend to drift. Um, if you're truly surrounded, and I, and I don't use the word surrounded lightly, if you're really surrounded where you can see these people's properties from your property, and there's not a 50 to 100 foot buffer of forest with understory shrubs or other species under the trees in between, then I would encourage you to first, before you create habitat, um, get involved with um, NOFA's work with the community uh, pesticide reduction outreach. Uh, Marty Dagoberto, who's on this uh, Zoom, um, he um, is very active on that. And um, try to get your neighbors to uh, get some awareness of what they're doing. Um, because I don't think the first step in your case is installing habitat. I think you've got to take a step back and you've got to do some community outreach first before you put those habitat features in. Okay. I have a similar question. Mine's a little different though, because I've mostly talked my neighbors into stopping all the pesticides, but we have a GMO cornfield 500 feet away from my yard. So, um, I think I may even be able to, you know, gather some of the neighborhood. We all have at least two to five acres. We could, most of it's in, in lawns and we could potentially create an amazing pollinator corridor here. What is the impact of that GMO cornfield, which they spray with, they spray with glyphosate to kill off the vegetation every year? Well, glyphosate itself, um, only harms bees. I mean, I'm not going to get into a whole glyphosate discussion, but studies have shown that it harms bees um, if it's sprayed directly on them mostly. And particularly Roundup is the most harmful because it has added chemicals that are known as wetting agents, which prevent the bees from being able to uh, fly or move around or um, you know, or eat, I think they become disoriented to a certain extent. But the real concern for me is not the glyphosate, it's if they're using neonicotinoids. Now, there's GMO corn that uses neonicotinoids. There's GMO corn where the corn is treated at the seed level with neonicotinoids. And then I believe that there might even be GMO corn that doesn't have neonicotinoids involved in the production cycle. I'm not 100% certain of that, but I would like to think that there is a way to grow GMO corn without neonicotinoids per se. If the corn is treated with neonicotinoids at the seed level and they're not spraying neonicotinoids on the site and they're only spraying herbicides like glyphosate, you might be okay because bees don't pollinate corn. Mm -hmm. If they're spraying neonicotinoids onto the fields, I would absolutely uh, urge you not to do a pollinator habitat anywhere close to there. Okay, so I'll ask the farmer. I know the farmer and I was- uh, Yeah, just find out what they're spraying. Like, you know, maybe if you phrase it in a non, you know, non-accusatory manner, you will find that he'll answer you very honestly. 
Yeah, I've already established a good relationship with them. They know I'm very upset about the spraying, but we're in conversation and so far so good. I'm hoping in the future to gather the neighborhood and see if we can gently push them towards different practices. That's great. I, I think it's great that you're doing that kind of, you know, having those kinds of conversations. I think that's something that people need to have more of. So I, I commend you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are approaching 8.15. Um, so I think we maybe could take one more question and then um, we will say good night. And the, if no one has one immediately, the last question that I remember from the chat before it froze was someone was asking about what a, a bee nesting strip is. Okay, um, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen again. I'll go back to the slide where I had that. Um, let me just see here. Um, Ken, okay, here, uh, share screen. Okay, let's get the PowerPoint up. Do you guys see the PowerPoint? My screen is frozen. Yeah, no, I don't see the screen. No, it's not up. It's not okay. up now. Uh, one second. I went into full screen here. How's that? Okay. Yes. Are we are we on the landing? Okay, so we'll go back. So the bee nesting strip is um, you're really um, you're digging down about four inches in the soil, and you are um, filling it with a mix of sand and the existing soil that you removed. And you are keeping it free of vegetation. By doing so, you are creating a, like an ideal nesting area for a native bee. So you can see here, we recommended in the Chapman pasture site um, that they simply create just a few areas that were 10 feet by 20 feet wide because it's a larger site and it's not a place that people are going to every week to check on. In a smaller garden situation, you could have a bee nesting strip that was two by four feet. And you basically dig down four inches, you remove all the existing vegetation, grasses, weeds, whatever, and you mix back in the topsoil with coarse sand and you keep it without any vegetation for the life of the project. So you try to weed it regularly. And um, if the site, the site should be sunny, um, the bee nesting strip should be in a sunny location that gets full sun. It should be well draining soil. So not a wet seep or a wet meadow um, or an area that a property drains into. And if the soils of a site are naturally sandy, you don't need to add the sand. You can just remove the vegetation. And if you really want to take it a step further, you can situate the bee nesting strip in a garden or in a landscape adjacent to native bunching grasses and sedges because those help to provide um, suitable nesting sites for many ground nesting bees. They like to nest at the base of those bunching grasses. 